Okay, so today we're going to study about the foundation of Simon D Web from the okay, from the different uh, layers that compose this architecture. Uh, we start from the, the most basic uh, uh, foundation, which is the RDF representation, mm -hmm. which is a, mainly a model for representing data, not just a language or a formula. Mm -hmm. So, uh, starting from the picture that you saw last time uh, on the first uh, classes, during the introduction classes, uh, we are basically we are we are at the bottom here of the stack of the, sem of the semantic stack. Okay, so uh, everything about uh, ontologies, reasoning, uh, and uh, data representation is based uh, on this RDF format, with a bit uh, of uh, say schema level for defining the terms that you use in RDF. So today we'll talk about this, these layers on, we, on top of which everything else uh, will be constructed. Actually, as we saw yesterday, starting from RDF, you could actually go two different ways. You can go the query way, so all the word about uh, uh, linked data applications that uh, just use uh, or exploit uh, open standard uh, and uh, interoperable inform um, exchange of information over the web so all the linked data world uh, that we talk uh, next week next uh, class or you can go uh, on uh, climbing the ladder of the semantics uh, you go towards ontologies and uh, reasoning and so on so there are basically two very different approaches uh, that are both based uh, on the simplicity basically and the uh, versatility of the RDF form. So uh, RDF uh, means uh, resource description framework. So it's a framework, it's a method, it's a model, it's also a language or a set of languages uh, for describing resources. That's, that's what the name says. And uh, these resources could be any web resource or more specifically a semantic web resource so the term resource would be very 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 um, wide so we, we use it in a very wide sense uh, to mean uh, basically everything that can that we could attach an, an, an identifier to so everything that can be identified is a resource that we can for which we can describe its properties or we can declare some information about uh, just if it will just if you are just able to identify the element. So the, the, the requirement uh, for representing something on the semantic web is basically being able to have an identification scheme and identification method for resources. Identifying doesn't mean fetching or retrieving. So I can have a, mm, a website, identifying the website means knowing the address. Retrieving the web page means going to that address and getting the data, getting information from that. We don't even need that. So we need just something to, that could be identified in the web, so it doesn't, some, every, every resource should have an address name that can be expressed into web uh, 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 say standards and that's it. Uh, it. It doesn't even need to exist. So we can describe resources that don't exist on the web that could exist, but we just make them up even if they, if they don't really exist. And also we can also describe properties about real things, objects. Okay. If I take this bottle, this is not on the web. It's on the table. But nevertheless. I could uh, create an identifier that represents specifically this one. So this identifier could be constructed as the as a web address, basically, and so that will allow me to describe the, the color of this bottle, uh, but by associating the color blue to the identifier of the bottle that I create. This identifier doesn't exist as a web page. The bottle isn't a web page, isn't information, but it's something that we can describe. So we are. That's why we, we use the resource in a very, very uh, wide sense. 
and uh, when they designed uh, RDF, uh, people were already using a lot of different several uh, proprietary methods uh, for representative uh, information. So there were already uh, many research groups or many sta many uh, techniques, standards, tools that, of course, were used for representative information. RDF was designed to be very very simple, uh, to be able to be applied in many use cases simple but at the same time uh, mathematically sound i uh, will spend some time probably not too much uh, uh, in trying to understand the, mathemat the mathematics the formalism behind rdf for now uh, it would be enough to know that everything you write in, in rdf actually it has a meaning at, this, at the law the formal logic level at the mathematical level so it's not just a programming language that okay we create a new statement uh, and we give a semantic by just by describing how it, how it works so everything we write in rdf is uh, validated mm? it, uh, it has a uh, non-ambiguous meaning mm? a formal semantics stands for that so actually if you have a look at the documents that describe rdf there are actually two different words two completely different universes i would say not just words there are documents that describe RDF from the point of view of people that are going to use it for writing statements, okay, like we are. And another document, another set of documents that describe the foundation, the mathematical foundations that give the meaning of every statement you write. The second part is, I wouldn't say totally inaccessible, but uh, it requires a very high degree of, of knowledge and of specific knowledge in formal logics. Hmm? Uh, but we don't we don't need to do that. No. People creating algorithms for dealing with RDF, of course, will need to know all the mathematical properties, but not the user creating information. So we have both of the, of the advantages here. Something very easy to use, very simple to learn, but on the other hand, it's very powerful because then you can construct uh, a lot of algorithms because uh, uh, of this uh, mathematical formulation. Not many languages do that. Okay. Um, the vocabulary, so the way of describing objects, uh, is all is based on just one <laughs> type of data, which are URIs, so web addresses. So every information, every data, every resource, we we'll say, uh, is uh, uh, described by uh, a URI. Uh, I was designed by having a, an XML syntax in mind because at the time where RDF was invented, uh, XML looked like the, uh, the next big thing uh, and that would be able to solve every problem. Mm -hmm. uh, now we hate, we tend to hate XML, not used very much because it's very verbose, very lengthy as a representation, and, uh, but it, we don't care about uh, this uh, aspect in, in RDF because RDF uh, can be serialized, so can be written in many different formats, not just the original XML one. And the important point is this one, the last one also, is that in contrast to knowledge bases, expert systems, closed systems, where you have your knowledge stored in your server, in your system, you have a list of facts of, of things you know of inferences of information that is stored in your system and that's it if anybody else wants to change or extend the information that you have in your system should call you and say please could you add this information or could, could you could you give could you give me access to your system in order to edit it or to enhance or to add information okay rdf is not this way in rdf like in the web anybody can add a new information to existing data set. Like anybody can create a web page that will link to another web page. To link to an existing web page doesn't require having access to that web page. I just create my own page and another link. RDF is the same. Adding information doesn't require uh, the capability of modifying the information that I'm uh, linking to or that I'm connecting to. I just can, just can add new facts uh, and this fact will merge into the existing database. 
So that's the word priority. Everybody creates their own set of uh, web pages. In this case, we everybody creates their own set of uh, RDS statements of facts uh, that we want to represent. And all these facts can be taken together, can, can look, can link to each other without requiring permission. It's just a matter of convincing other people that, that they should trust also the facts that you wrote. Hmm? But we'll come to that. Um, RDF uh, is usually not learned starting, starting from the language, because the language is quite boring, uh, but uh, instead uh, is defined in terms of an actor syntax, which is a graphical syntax. So nodes and arrows and uh, ovals and rectangles and so on. So uh, that would be the abstract formalization of our language. Then this abstract formalization can be serialized into a, it's a, it's a graph model, basically, can be serial, serialized into a text file on one, on one hand, or can be translated into uh, formal, let's say, representations for for example, feeding a theorem prover or a reasoner that needs to process this data. And all these semantics are modeled by a set of rules uh, that tells us what, what, are, what are the basic logic inferences that we can do with RDF. But this is the second part, okay? That for the moment, we, we know that it exists. Uh, we know that somebody worked hard uh, to give formal meaning to the statements that we write. Uh, but we don't need, for the moment, to understand them fully. Um, and all these levels, uh, so the model, which is the graph, the RDF graph, the interpretation of semantics, all the mathematical part, and all the, the syntax, so the textual, the, the filing uh, serialization, are separated by, by the link. So it's very clear, you know, we, have, we have these three words that are very easy to go from one representation to another. So we reason, we learn about the, the graph structure, and then we learn how to translate the graph into a text file in order to be able to write it, because we don't, we don't draw it. And the language is so simple that actually it only has uh, one type of statement, plus an import, and uh, uh, two types of data, two data types. The data types that, are, that, that exist in RDF are just literals, a literal in the sense of XML, so it could be a number or a string, basically, so very atomic information, or a URI. We can do that, a web address. That's it. On top of this, we can define our own data types, but the, the only two native data types are URI and literals. Um, what we describe lies in the web, in the, uh, in the semantic web philosophy, where we have this uh, open world assumption. In order to, to work uh, in a, at the web scale, so the worldwide uh, semantic web, um, we can never know, or we can never state, we can never assume that the, uh, all the information we have is all the information that there will ever be in the future. So we, we, can, we cannot describe in any way a limit to the information we describe. So the open word assumption means that uh, uh, we, everybody, anybody, can make statements or as, uh, assert that some statements or some facts are true. Anybody. There are no limits. So, if anybody can make a statement, it means that I cannot, I'm not allowed by the language to create a statement that will forbid you or forbid another person to make their statement. Mm, to make it short, there is no negatives in RDF. I cannot say uh, there uh, in RDF or in ontologies something negative, uh, saying that, for example, uh, you know, uh, birds without wings uh, don't exist. 
I can create a lot of information about bird with wings uh, because it's information that I, I have and maybe every information that I describe is about birds with wings uh, okay but I will never be sure or I will never be able to say that every bird should have wings or there, there will never be a bird without wings or something like that so I can, I can never close my world okay so I, I will be always be able to prove that something exists uh, probably but there will not in, a, in the semantic reasoning there will not be a possibility of proving that something doesn't exist because you can never rule out the hypothesis that somebody else will tomorrow or maybe or today but in a different part of the world will have some facts some information that makes true something that currently is not known okay so we only have two sets two truth values in the semantic web in the open world something that we know is true or we, we trust it's true we assert it's true or something that we don't know about hmm? there's no notion of being false true or not or maybe inconsistent but it's another issue so that the set of statements uh, uh, doesn't hold but it's not about describing the world this means that completeness is never guaranteed so it's never the model is never finished we describe a set of information it's a very pragmatic view we describe a set of information which is the minimal amount of information that we need for our application this languages were not designed for you know philosophers not to reason about things they have been designed for uh, for being the foundation for tools to create applications so uh, it was a very uh, a practical approach even if there's a lot of mathematics behind that but the the, 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 the ultimate goal was having something that you can when you have some information, you can describe it and operate on it and work with it. Okay? Probably, possibly also with standard tools because we have, you are using standard representation languages so you don't have to write your own tools because you can use uh, something that's already been uh, described. So at the beginning, this open world is a bit strange, but we you make use to, it, to that. Okay, so how to you know, uh, get to know the structure of an adversarial presentation. Well, basically, um, the first two ballots uh, will tell us 90% uh, of, of what we need to know, and then the rest will be more details about that. So, uh, basically, RDF is a language expressing predicates about resources and uh, a predicate is a trifle so everything in the rdf world is a trifle every sentence we predicate is a, si a single trifle where we can find a subject a predicate a verb and an, an, an object for this statement okay so everything, every information that we have that we want to represent should be broken down in a set of triples like that. It's a triple language. So this is the simplest form, the most atomic form of language. You cannot make with less than three. You cannot create a language with less than three elements, subject, predicate, and object. So it's the bare minimum. Every, every information which is more complex requires us it requires us to, to break it down into basic triples. Okay? And we usually draw these triples as graph pictures where the subject and the object are nodes in the graph and the predicates, the verbs, the actions are the edges, the arrows in the graph. Um, so of course, with one single trifle, you cannot con uh, convey a lot of information, you cannot represent a lot of information. You could say, this battle has a color blue. This is information that we can say. 
But if we also want to say that this bottle contains water, for example, or that sheet it is on the table, uh, we need to have more trifles describing further predicates about the same subject. Or if we have another object which is blue, we can add other predicates that, have, that share blue as an object. And maybe sooner or later we want to say that blue is a color. Because right now it was just a word, it was just a string of text, it was just an identifier. And so this object, uh, blue, will become the subject of another statement, saying blue is a color. Or even blue is darker than black. No, sorry, lighter than black. And it's darker than pink, for example, for some kinds of pinks and blues. And so there is no, uh, there is a sort of a interchangeability between subjects and objects, usually. Each of them is an identifier that plays a role into a statement. We'll see later that also predicates are in some way dual and can become subject or object. So uh, we design at two levels. We have the, in the individual statements of three elements and uh, a set of statements which, is, which compose a bigger graph. A graph with many arrows and every arrow actually represents a triangle. So in general, an RDF expression is a collection of many triangles that may share subjects and objects or maybe completely unrelated, but of, of usually it's more useful if this graph is connected, no? connects information. Uh, so this is another example. We have subject and predicate and object uh, uh, that we describe always in this graphical notation. Hmm? Uh, since we discovered that subjects and objects could be interchanged in a way, uh, we use a more general term, we call them nodes. Okay, these are two different nodes, uh, and in every statement, a node can play the role of the subject or can play the role of the object. Uh, predicate or property hmm, uh, can be used interchangeably, so it's more maybe easy to say that uh, blue is a property of this bottle. Okay, the, the bottle has the property of having, having color with object blue and uh, okay let's let's keep the blank notes for the moment we we'll see them later and what what could you use as a subject what could you use an as an object and what could you use a a as a predicate so it turns out that subjects predicates and objects are all of them are URL references so web addresses we'll, we'll see the UV ref uh, definition in a while. Just imagine uh, a web address. So actually, we shouldn't write here you know, Blade Runner, but we should write something like HTTP, I don't know, slash uh, IMDB.com slash actors, oh sorry, movies slash Blade Runner. Uh, because a name, a string, is by its nature ambiguous. We use the, the web syntax to have domains in which names are defined. Um, and we, we'll see that in a moment. So usually, instead of a single word, these should be top, complete addresses. Okay. So if we are talking about the semantic web course, I just can write semantic web course because there may be maybe hundreds of semantic web courses. If I write something like uh, www.polito.it slash courses slash semantic web, it becomes something that is less ambiguous. At least you know that this name is defined into that domain. It's nothing new. We are just borrowing from the web method of uh, compartmentalizing things so in the web you can create your own website inside your domain good 
and here you can create your own names, your own identifiers inside your domain or inside anybody else's domain. But this is clear when you are creating names. There is an exception that the object may also be, in addition to being a, an identifier, a literal. Let's keep our black bones as I say. Literal means a string. So, uh, well, let's see in a second. Yeah. Um, like this, yeah, for example. This could be a node representing the movie. This could be a node representing the string containing the name of the movie. So this movie has a name, and the name of the movie is just a data, final data, final information. It's just a literal string, in this case, or a number. Okay, we, we see an example to, to clarify this. Uh, so, what's the meaning of writing an RBF track? The meaning is uh, Some truth holds. No, everything is you know, uh, behind this verb. Some relationship holds between the things denoted by the subject and the things denoted by the object. So when I am asserting an RDF statement, asserting means, okay, I'm writing that, I believe in it, I say it, I, I write it, in, I publish it on my website, on my knowledge base. So I'm in a way, saying that this is true. True in the sense that I am asserting that it should be true. It's not true in the mathematical sense. Okay? If I say that this bottle is blue, okay, it can be true or not. You're seeing it, you can check in the real world whether this assertion in the RDF representation is really true or not okay but if i hide the bottle and say okay i have a green bottle and this bottle is green you don't know whether it's true or not but we can go ahead and say okay you i am asserting that it's green so let's go move forward and see maybe the, the, the consequences of this of this statement uh, something doesn't need to be really, really true in the world for us to treat as if it were true and then do in computation on that. Okay, let's assume x, x is equal to 3 and we do our, our computation assuming that x is equal to 3. Maybe we discover that x will be equal to 5 and so our conclusion will be wrong, probably. Okay, so we must distinguish two planes of truth. One is uh, the truth that we create by creating the RDF state. It's a truth that starts with a set of actions, of facts. Every RDF statement we write, is, a, is mathematically speaking, is an action. It's a fact that cannot be verified. It's a fact that cannot be proven or demonstrated. It's just a fact. And the truth of this fact, this, this, uh, I assume that the, this fact is true if I trust the author of, the, of the, this fact. Then there could be a factual uh, truth where we check whether the description actually matches the reality, the, the real world that we are modeling. But it's a separate issue. The second issue is not uh, covered actually in any way by the semantic web. Because the semantic web lives on the web, it doesn't live on the physical object, so I cannot check information like that. Okay, it's not uh, something that we can uh, we can check or we can verify by our reason. We start from some facts uh, that we assume to be true. The the word that we that they use here is we assert a fact. I am asserting that this bottle is this blue. If you accept this fact, then you will treat it as a source of truth. Okay, yes, it has been asserted, so we 
assume it's true and we move forward we don't question the truthness of, of this fact but starting from a set of true facts or asserted facts uh, then we can be worth for discovering new new information mm -hmm. uh, technically we can assert a single statement uh, single triple or we can assert a graph and asserting a graph means uh, so a graph with many statements uh, it means that each and every statement in the graph is asserted individually and all of them are true at the same time So you imagine that from a logical point of view, you have a very big end operation. This is true, and this, and this, and this. And you put into this big end operation all of your facts, all of your RDF statements, and all of RDF statements published by anybody else that you want to consider, that you want to try. All these facts are put together hmm, into a, a unique model. So there's only one model. Um, okay, so the simple facts are just uh, simple triples of information. So the simplest information that you can say that uh, maybe I am working at Polytechnico. So uh, I am working at the Polytechnico. I need uh, three identifiers, one for representing me one for representing working at a work relationship and one for representing the object the polytechnic so for example the easiest one is polytechnic for example it's, a, it's an institution that, that already has a website a domain so every information about the polytechnic could be represented actually by its address its identifier we are not visiting the website of Polytechnic here and now. We're just saying, okay, we use the name of something that is already associated with this institution, the, the name of the website, as the identifier of the website itself. Okay, we could use another identifier, I don't know, the Partita IVA, which is unique in Italy, but it's not unique in, in the world. We could use the address, the street address of the place some information identifier that matches uniquely to the concept of the polytechnic institution the easiest one the most natural one is just the name of the website hmm? and uh, we don't have a website for people for individual people so i can assume that it's not true but we could assume maybe there's somewhere a directory of names of persons so that if there is a directory somewhere, and if there isn't, we can also create our own. Everybody's free to express new facts or to give names to ideas, to concepts. Um, in this directory, the directory contains maybe uh, cities, contains institutions, contains schools, contains people. So maybe there's an entry in this institution, we'll see the symptoms we have later on. Uh, which is related to me but this doesn't really need to exist we just created an identifier which is very unlikely to match with any other identifier in the world except those matching my person probably hmm? so this is just an identifier string an identifier that I constructed to represent this person You could invent your own, as you want. Of course, uh, the issue is that uh, I, I could invent an identifier for you and for you and for you. Uh, maybe if we have some standard, uh, there's, it's more likely that the identifier that you, I use for your person would be the same that you use for yourself. But nobody, nobody forbids me uh, to call you with some identifier that I like to use. But if, if I'm the only, the, the only person in the world to use that specific identifier will not be linked to anybody else. So it will be a, a graph, a very isolated part of the graph. So that's, but that's another issue. It's more a social issue. Huh? How to agree 
on a set of commonly shared identifiers for representing commonly known uh, entities, people, location, countries, and so on. This is something the linked data will, will try to solve. And then there is the relationship uh, work. I'm working at Polyphony, which is different from I'm lecturing at Polytechnic, which is different from I'm living nearby Polytechnic, or which is different from I park my car at Polytechnic. So from the same with the same subject and the same uh, uh, object, you can create many different relationships with different meaning, with different semantics. So again, the relationship should be identified with some non-ambiguous identifier. And since the relationship uh, that a person works at an institution is a common one, there are some vocabularies that already define this relationship for us. So this vocabulary, thought, means uh, friend of a friend. Some people just standardize this vocabulary that has uh, uh, basic uh, concepts like uh, working, uh, being friends, being family, uh, being the um, describing hierarchy of people into, into a company and so on. Relationship between people. So I could again make up my own my own identifier. I could say, okay, HTTP uh, relationships.com slash working. But instead of inventing a new uh, way of representing the same information, I just relied on some existing dictionary vocabulary, the right term, that already defined the and so it's more likely that somebody else in the world describing where they work will use the same identifier and so we could match these two graphs created by different people because they are using the same vocabularies okay it's not a requirement for rds it's a requirement for the usefulness of the information that we describe in rds by itself rds doesn't care at all what we write there. It only checks whether this or this or that address are equal or different to another one. That's it. There's no real meaning, semantics, in using one identifier or another. It just maps uh, all the identifiers it sees to different objects. The only notion that the RDS processor has is whether two identifiers are the same or not. If they are not the same, okay, they are different objects. It's uh, for the user or, of RDS, which is useful to try and reuse as much as possible common namespaces, common vocabularies, and not creating their own. Okay, to make the model more easy to share. Instead of, uh, and we'll see how it happens. But it's magic, basically an agreement between users to use the same vocabularies. It's not a requirement from the language, it's not a requirement from the tools, it's just uh, useful for the users. It's, a, it's something that it, it makes your work easier. Um, well, this is just a representation, the graphical representation. The same information we already know that you can represent that into a database, for example, or uh, in logic predicates and functional uh, representation and so on. Uh, what are the differences? Why do we use uh, RDF? Well, first of all, RDF is much more limited because this database table only has, uh, for the moment, two columns. But if we need it, we can extend to three, four, five columns. In RDF, we cannot have statements with more than three elements, sub predicate and object. So actually, RDF is simpler, more basic than databases. Of course, we can express the same information as a database table with five columns, but we will require probably four different statements. Hmm? So it's more um, elementary, I must say. But if we want uh, to make a parallel, 
we have basically these uh, statements here they are called instance statements because they are already thinking about the authority um, that correspond to rows in a, in a table representing facts so every row in a table is one or more statements it's just one statement if the table has two columns is more statements it must be broken down to most more statements if the table has more columns and uh, um, the data the key the identity of the elements in databases you only have one primary key per table here every field every element is a key for itself must be unique for itself or as a unique value all these URIs are unique by construction you don't have two different you will never name two different objects two different representations with the same URI by the way of constructing the converse would could happen okay so we, we can have two different URIs describing the same information but then it would be easy for us to say that okay these and that are the same we can merge them so it's possible to have many different names identifiers actually for the same information it's not possible in semantic web to have uh, uh, the same identifier used for representing different different types of information hmm? okay um, we know that databases are especially relational databases are very structured you must know actually the structure of every table and how they connect to each other. RDF by itself doesn't have any of these rules. It's free structure. Of course, free structure means that we will never know or we can never anticipate what kind of statements uh, somebody in the world will make about this model. Maybe in the future we want to say not limit, limit is impossible for the open world assumption but at least suggest that this is a bottle so you may have a property that is called the capacity how many liters or uh, cubic centimeters of, of, of liquid can it contain and this is a property we can only share by bottles and glasses and uh, other containers so in a way we are saying that this is not just there is a difference between this keys and this bottle they are, can be both identified in rdf but we expect to know some property of this which are different from some property of those and so we want to express some rules about which are the allowed relationships it's not true it's not the allow every relationship is good is allowed but it's the normal uh, the suggested relationship uh, having a notion of type of a resource well up to now resource is just a key it's just an identifier okay it, this identifier represents an object or, or information of a given type and so information of a given type should have some rules in the attributes in the uh, properties they have it's something that we add on top of RDF. RDF by itself doesn't have any notion. We create it in two steps uh, from with RDF schema first and with ontology later. later. So ontologies will be used uh, to give the rules by which the information we describe in RDF must comply. So with this information at the RDF level, it's all uh, the Wild West. Uh, you can do everything you want. You want. But if you want to impose some rules saying that all the containers should have a capacity, that then RDF is not enough. You must move uh, to an ontology language, which is based on RDF. It just extends RDF with some new verbs that assume a specific, a specific meaning. Okay. Um, Well, the, here is, there's an example of another simple uh, RDF graph. We see that we have uh, one, several nodes that describe some information about this movie. 
So Blade Learning is directed by Ridley Scott. Uh, the name of Ridley Scott is this one. So why do we write the name twice? Okay, because this is a string. Open quote. Uh, Ridley Scott closing quote with the capital, with the space, and the actual name. Um, this is an identifier that represents the director. So it should start with HTTP or something, but it's not, it could not be for the space reasons. It was not reported here. And the same there. We have, we have the identifier for the movie and then the name of the movie. And the name is something that is linked with the relationship name between the owner, actually, and the string represented the name. So this on the right hand column as well are all literals values they cannot be linked to each other they cannot be used as subjects describing something else so imagine a literally just like a number three three is, doesn't represent a specific information it's just a value so you cannot say three is beautiful is the number it doesn't make sense you cannot have any arrow starting from or leaving a literal so we say that uh, subjects predicates and objects could be all URIs all identifiers plus objects could be literals only objects you cannot have a literal as a subject you cannot have a literal as a predicate so, for example, you cannot link this string Blade Runner to this string which is caught with any kind of relation. Be because these are just two strings. You never know if whether Blade Runner, if you just look at the string, if this uh, is the name of the movie or if it's the name uh, of a book or if it's the name, uh, I don't know, of a new brand of whiskey that somebody in the world called Blade Runner or if it's a name of a challenge that we create around the world no, it's just a name, just a string, it's just a text it's too ambiguous RDF forbids you to create ambiguous representations okay? if you want to say something about Blade Runner the movie then use this concept and link to link it everywhere you want but not the string the string is just some information attached to the movie the real concept is here uh, we should also uh, try to make the effort of uh, let's say blurring this picture try to imagine that this picture is not written with English words but with uh, you know Japanese words or Chinese characters. This is what the machine will see. The semantics is not in the name, is not in the string that we write. The semantics is on the relationship that we create between the different types. These two are equal, so they are the same. These two are different, so they are kept separate. And how they how they relate? And do they relate with the same relationship as the other two, or they relate with a different relationship? So semantics, the meaning of things, is not represented in the, in the, in the values, on the data. Rather, it's represented in the relationships between the nodes. Okay, we could call this node A and B instead of Blade Runner and Ridley Scott, and uh, C and C instead of name, and D instead of list date, and F uh, instead of directed. And it wouldn't change a bit this information. It would not change a single bit of information. And it would not change the capability of reasoning about this information. So the more we, the more structure we create in this RDF graphs, uh, the more expressive our model will be. For example, if we have a sentence like that, there's a person 
which we choose to identify with this uh, address because this, this person was actually a real person that <laughs> proposed this example so he was talking about himself Eric Miller that was working or probably still working at the w 3 organization at the WC and, uh, and so uh, for identity of this person it just shows the web page that he had uh, on the website of the w 3 and uh, we know the name, we know the email address of this person, we know that he's a doctor as a title. So this is just one sentence in English, but it must be translated into several statements in our DM. First of all, we have an identifier and we know that this identifier is about a person not about a cat, a bottle, a table or some keys okay. so we can have this identifier saying that this identifier is a person and again instead of creating our own identifier we, we picked uh, from uh, some existing vocabulary Okay, we swap vocabulary published on this website years ago. It's a vocabulary that has been created for describing address books, basically, contact lists. And we say that uh, this identifier has type person. We hope that every, many other people creating RDF graphs, uh, when they are talking about people, we hope they will use the same concept to map here. We will use the same vocabulary that we are using. We hope. Uh, type uh, is a type of relationship which is part of uh, RDF schema, uh, which is a, 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 a normative vocabulary, which is not compulsory, but has been defined. So if we want to express type information, I must use this RDF syntax, RDF schema um, concept. And then uh, this person has a name, full name. So again, we use uh, this uh, representation for the address book uh, vocabulary as this email address and uh, this title. So actually, we are exploiting this swap vocabulary for describing information about this person. The difference between the um, orange and the green blocks uh, are that, as you see, the green blocks are URIs, addresses, while the uh, orange ones are just text, literal. Usually, we just to, to make the distinction clear, and we, we cannot always use colors, uh, notes, let's say, uh, URI nodes, so the resource nodes are always oval and uh, uh, literals are always rectangular. Okay, usually a rectangle is a literal, represents a literal. So we have different nodes uh, and we see, okay, we didn't care too much about uh, not being a subject or an object. So in this case, uh, this node was always the subject for three. Uh, statements uh, and this was the object for one of them but nobody nobody could create a problem if we had another relationship that you use uh, uh, EM, um, em contact me as an object they are interchangeable you say so nodes are used as subject or objects uh, and they all they are all in identified by a string looking like a web address Predicates are represented as arrows, and again they are represented as with the web addresses, with identifiers that look like web addresses. And literals are just represented as rectangles with strings, uh, could be strings, could be numbers. There is a syntax, we, we don't want to be crazy about that, uh, about literals, how to represent a literal, so it could be a string usually, a string, it could be a localized string okay this person is a doctor if we write it in english but it's a dot 
if you write in Italian. So we may have many different uh, predicates. It's not like imagine a database. In the database, you say you have a person and then you have a column for the title. And you must choose this column whether it will contain the English or the Italian version of the title. Yeah, it's not a problem. We represented personal title to be doctor. We can also represent another relationship, always of type personal title. There are no cardinality restrictions here. Of type doctor, it is. So it's fine that the language, the localization of this property is in Italian. You can always extend a, a model with further information if you want. There's nothing that can prevent you from adding a new uh, relationship, a new piece of information. You don't need to prepare the model for accommodating information. You can just add one triple and your, this new information will be uh, represented. Then, of course, it will be the, the trouble will be on the tools on your application that will process the data and you want to maybe describe the, the, um, the business card of this person and you find that there are two titles. So it's the application that will have to decide which of the two titles will be shown to the user. But it's an application problem, not a, not a knowledge representation problem. We are trying to represent all the information we have independently from the application that we want that will be will use, will uh, will need it will use it hmm? many times we don't need the, the the application yet we can also bind uh, some uh, literal to um, a data type if we want to use xml schemas for data typing so xml schema if you know that i don't know a lot of people studied xml many years ago and then people uh, don't study it anymore because it's not so important, so relevant, but it, it does, it's a language that has a complete type system. So if you want to enforce, or not enforce, it's not possible to enforce anything else yet. If you want to declare that this literal represents a number, you can do that in this really simple. But, or this number represents a date. Hmm? We saw that uh, before we had a date here. So instead of writing that on the 25th of June 1982, it's better to use a, 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 an, an, an explicit format. Uh, for example, if the I, ISO standard for dates means years, then months, then days, and they explicitly say that this is the date, it's not just a string. No, so that you can do sorting all sorts of population on data. But all of this is useful for the applications that use the information is totally irrelevant for the RDF processing. In RDF, a literal is just a black box of data that is stored in the model. It doesn't participate into reasoning. RDF doesn't even care whether two literals are the same or not. With identifiers, it's important to know whether they are the same or not, not uh, because they will be merged, but not literals. Literals are always assumed to be different hmm, to each other, unique. Okay, uh, let's come to the definition of this uh, URI name that has been used many times. Uh, so we are used uh, to write, uh, uh, to navigate the web and every website, every web page has an address that is called uh, formally a ULL, a URL, sorry. Uniform Resource Locator. Why locator? Because it's used to, it has been used to locate the page. We must find it all over the web. That is the page that we want, okay? Uh, we don't need that. URI is a more general concept. We just need to identify a resource. And the resource could be a web page or not. We will never check whether behind a, uh, an identifier there will really be a web page or not. We don't care. What everything we want is to identify a resource in a non ambiguous way. So that uh, and uh, we exploit the synthesis of URI so that every organization can identify things uh, in their domain. 
And these things could be, th online things could be things that are not online, that could be physical objects, could be abstract objects, like person we had before. Person is an abstract concept. And uh, additionally, we have a URI ref, URI ref syntax. Uh, it represents a URI with a reference, URI ref. <coughs> All these R's, it gets difficult to pronounce, but uh, um, it means uh, a URI with a hash character and the fragment name. So in, a, uh, in a HTML, the hash is used to mark a, a NAND core, so a, point, a specific point inside the page. You don't use much today, but to, to scroll to a given point of a page, you create a link to the hash name. Um, what is used for? Well, basically, if we want, so let's go come back. Every different resource should have a different identifier. Every identifier should look like a web address. That's it. Third step, uh, if we want to have also some documentation about what we are publishing, it's a good practice to make this URI actually a URL, so something that can be retrieved and seen and downloaded. It's not required for the reasoning, but for the user say, okay, oh, okay, person. What is this person? What that, that, what does it represent? Okay, it could be a clear concept. We know what a person is, but let's see the definition. Let's see what are the usually uh, relationships that the person be belongs to and so on. And so how can we discover that? Well, the easiest way is that to go to, web, to that web page. So usually the URIs that we create, but it's just a, a convention, it's not required, it's not a requirement, have a dual role. They serve as identifiers, unique identifiers for the RDF side. But for the user side, they are also clickable, okay? You can also retrieve the page and you get the information about it. Okay, what happens if you have to, if you want to define a vocabulary, to define many terms? Okay, so we want to describe something about Polytechnico, so we need to describe what is a, a degree, what's a course, uh, uh, what's a department, what's a, we, we define many concepts that are relevant to our organization. We, you would have to create many different identifiers. But if you want this identifier to be self-documenting, sort of having some web page behind to describe it, you need to create a lot of very small web pages, each of them corresponding to a single URL. So practically what they do is to publish only one web page that contains many different definitions. And so you use this syntax say, okay, this is the web page you arrive, hash fragment points to the specific word inside that web page. So you get the simplicity of having on one page all the definitions, but uh, that would be only, so if the, uh, one page has many definitions, we need to have a way of differentiating the identifiers of these different definitions. And we do that by appending uh, a fragment notation after the URI. Uh, we could probably also try that if uh, the internet helps us today. For example, uh, use this one. Oops. What's that? Let's see if it's true or if it's still alive. So this is an identifier that we can use in our page, but if we try to, to fetch that page, okay, we find a, an RDF document. We don't know the syntax yet, but uh, if we know that, that we have a person, find a hash person somewhere, you see that this person used many times, we don't know the, the syntax yet, as I said. So the, 
this document describes uh, several property of, of this person but it also describes uh, other concepts like uh, the person has a, a home page for example uh, as an address for example as many other properties so there are many different identifiers all packed all described in a single file okay that's the role of this uh, identifier we all of the, this document here these are web documents that describe many actually this document contains an rdf graph and this rdf graph defines many identifiers all these identifiers share the first the same prefix with a different uh, fragment suffix okay so this is a, an, easy, an easy way instead of making you know many different hundreds of different files uh, with two or three statements each okay um, so in general a node contains a URI ref an identifier hmm, which is composed in this way and as I said uh, it's important for URI refs uh, to be compared imagine we have a user creating ref1 and a different user the pink user creating graph 2 and for some reason they used the same identifier a and a there of course it should not be just a imagine having a uniref which is very longer so it does not change or any clashes by chance uh, but it, it, exactly the same and b is also the same as b here and E is the same as E, and the other C, D, and F are different. Oh, sorry, no, C is also equal to that. D and F are different. When an RDF processor reads both information sources, with both graph 1 and graph 2, it automatically merges all the nodes that have the same, all the nodes uh, that have the same URI refs. Not the literals, as I said, but the URI refs that are identical. So actually, B with B will only become one node. A and A will only become one node and so on. This is a, a, uh, automatic merging of information. I have some information stored somewhere in a place one, and some other information stored in a different place. When I read this information, it's automatically merged if the, the authors care to use uh, standard identifiers for the resources and so we can discover new relationships c and e were not related according to mr graph 2 but now we discover that c through some sort of relationship mediated by d are in, are in some way related this is how we do we discover new information by putting together existing information and following the thread. So that's why it's important to choose unique URIs to avoid uh, merging something that is not really related. And at the same time, uh, it's good to choose standard URIs whenever possible to allow the merge. Of course, it's not uh, mandatory. It's you, it's your application that decides which graphs have to be merged. If somebody else in New Zealand, tomorrow morning, we create a, a link between uh, you know, F and A, for example, oh, we already have one, but between F and E in a graph tree, we may decide whether we want to merge also this information or not. There's no automatic way of merging all the information in the world. Okay? It would be very dangerous to do that. You decide which sources you want to trust. And then you merge the information coming from these sources. And merging very easy. In many knowledge bases, merging is a complex information because you have to match usually graph isomorphisms uh, that are anti-complete uh, algorithmic problems. Here we just have to match names, identity of strings. 
So it's a very lightweight information that, of course, relies on a simple technology, but on a careful planning for the people who wrote these identity files. And, uh, okay, these are the graphs that can be represented in many ways. It's just, uh, it's a data structure. It's a data structure for which you already have a lot of libraries for, uh, for uh, managing it, okay? There are, there are different formats in which you can save. This is a screenshot for a website uh, that we'll see in a moment uh, later, today. And uh, you know, so there are different ways uh, of exporting or representing the same information. The good part is that uh, you can choose the format according to the um, implement for to the application requirement. If you want to publish a website with embedded information, you can embed the RDF graph into an HTML page, for example. If you are creating a mobile application or responsive web application, you will probably exchange that in JSON. So you can encode the RDF into JSON format, and so on. Or if you're just using a, a regional or something like that, you can use some of the specific RDF format. But it's also equivalent. There are different ways of representing the same information. The semantics is always graphs. And uh, we saw that the, the, um, the first semantics, sorry, the first syntax for these graphs is XML. Um, and so many RDF documents are serialized in RDF. Usually it's called RDF over XML. RDF encoded in XML. How to how does it work? Okay, you see that we have here are some definition. Are you familiar with, with XML more or less? With namespaces especially. Okay. So um, here we are declaring some namespaces. XML and NS means a declaration of namespace. So we are declaring a namespace called RDF matching this URI. You see, it ends with a fragment. So that we can append different fragment names when we want. And we are, uh, so this is the namespace uh, that contains the names of the RDF uh, predefined uh, word. And uh, we define a contact namespace uh, that matches to this personal information management vocabulary here, in PIM. And so contact column person is the fragment person inside namespace contact. So this is a shorthand for HTTP, W3C.org, 2010, Swap, PIM, contact hash, Person. Okay, we have short hands here. Uh, so this is a way of, of uh, describing subject, predicate, and object. I. Okay, these are main spaces, but for example. We have an about, uh, represent the about uh, uh, attribute represents the subject. So, the subject, uh, remember the graph, we have this uh, uh, central node that was me, okay? EM me, contact me. This is the subject, uh, and many all the different uh, nested statements represent uh, a predicate and an object. The predicate, object predicate, object, and so on. In some cases, uh, let's say clean, the predicate is the XML entity, and the object is the body of the text. The body, the, the object could be a literal, and in that case, it would just be in the text. Or the, or the object could be a URI map, and so in this case, it would be mapped as an attribute, you see here. In this case, the object is not a literal, but it's a node. And the node is represented by a uh, 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 space, uh, um, uh, um, what's the word? Specifically, as the resource uh, attribute, as the resource attributes. 
So we have uh, an about attribute that represents subject or not, and a resource that represents object. And so, so we are uh, uh, compacting three different uh, relationships. EM as full name, as full name Eric Miller, EM as mailbox, mail to emwp.org, and EM personal title doctor. All text here. So one, two, and three. Plus a fourth one, which is some, somewhat hidden, is that uh, this uh, address is part of an element that is called person. So this represents the uh, predefined type statement. So it's a way we had a specific arrow in the picture in the graph that points, uh, points upward towards a type person, and this is implicit in XML uh, for this case. And this particular case we're seeing. The actual the XML syntax is much more complex. This is just an example to, to help us understand it. So if we still have the, the web page, we can have, uh, for example, uh, okay, for example, if ju just to read it, say that this resource here is of type uh, description and is uh, is a relationship called uh, subclass of with uh, an object that is th here mm -hmm. so it's all like that maybe uh, if we go forward we will find something more interesting no not, not very much No, this, uh, we need we need the uh, ontologies to understand it better. Okay, so uh, what? okay, so uh, maybe it's time for a break and some practical work. Okay, um, so if you take the the form that I gave to you earlier on. Okay. Didn't you feel it? Too bad. Because it was important that you try to feel it uh, while I was speaking, so you, you could not ask questions. It's important that you don't ask a question because I, I had a question for you. Okay, so, did you complete more or less? Which was the easiest field? Uh, I mean, eh? the, the easiest one. Easy, okay, oh, they are all easy, of course, these are uh, not uh, difficult questions. But uh, they may be ambiguous. Family name should be real quite precise, 
but if I check only family name. And, uh, but name in the row after that is more ambiguous. So what does it mean? Does it mean the first name, your given name, or the full name? There is an asymmetry here, okay? If I am asking um, given name and family name, that would be complete. Or just name, so it would be the full name. But if I'm asking the family name and the name, what are we expecting? So in terms of uh, semantics, uh, this is a problem because you don't know really what to expect here. So that, did everybody write their own first name here? Only the first name. So you did an interpretation because this word name was in a context. You just wrote your family name the row above. But in this triple, imagine RDS, you only had your identifier, name, and what do you expect on the other side? All the triples are isolated. So, the, the, it's very important to be very explicit about what kind of information we are expecting here. Image should be easy. Should look, probably there shouldn't be any uh, ambiguity about this information. Hmm? Student O, what did you write? PhD? How many people was PhD? Yeah. And no. Uh, no, no, no. No. What did you write? The name of the, the, name of the PhD. So, somebody wrote PhD, somebody wrote the name of the PhD. Did anybody write Polytechnical? One. Department. Okay. Sorry? The department. The department? Four. <laughs> <laughs> you have, we, have, we have nearly as many interpretations as people here. So, that's what we are fighting against. Okay, so that's why maybe we have dictionary, we have explicit uh, identifiers representing what kind of information we want. Uh, what, imagine if you try to, we will not do that today, try to transfer that into an RDF graph, probably the, you have to map this student top into something that is more precise or defined. And these two were particularly bad, Ho competence, what does it mean, okay? I don't know what did you get, some what I can do, or what degree do they have. And, uh, and so I, I don't know, I see that you wrote a lot of sentences there. I don't know the word. Just word. word. Okay. Keyword. And uh, hobbies also, it's uh, more, probably, probably it's easier. Because we use the names of sports or hobbies or something like that. Companies, right? what's the difference? The hobbies are a more concrete term, companies are a more abstract one. So we don't have, we, we cannot rely on physical objects, disciplines, uh, I don't know, Olympic <laughs> names or something like that, uh, like hobbies, or name or the name of a game or the name. Of, um, instead, uh, in, with competence, you can. Uh, it would be interesting to, to compare actually the word that you use, probably also the same information as is written in different terms. So, that it means that we need vocabularies of two types vocabularies of words, of properties. Okay, student of means uh, students of a, of, a, of a university or students of a PhD course or of the level of the student, master, bachelor, PhD. There are different relationships, we need to formalize them in a vocabulary. And those we need probably vocabularies or taxonomies of terms here. Okay. Uh, whether soccer or football or uh, skiing or traveling or uh, playing cards or whatever, probably it's better to have a list of them if we can. And all of this is pushing away from strings. If I have a list of items, each item, each hobby, becomes a URL, it becomes an identifier. That of course will also have a string representation, we also have a name, but we care less and less about the names, more about the identity of the other. And this one, the vacation of your dream, did you put a location or an activity? Or something else? The continent. The continent, okay. Uh, so, uh, 
who was the, at the continent level, you were only one, at the state level, no, at the, the country level, three, at the city level, one, at the others, at the plant level, or whatever, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the activity, or the type of activity. Yeah. Again, it was ambiguous, both in the nature of information, are we asking about the activity or are we asking about the location? And even within the location, it wasn't clear about which level of uh, representation we wanted to work. So it's just to, for a very simple, stupid form to see how many problems we will face when try to model even the simplest information with some simple but rigid rules, like our BIP. Okay, so what we propose to do is <coughs> maybe now to have a break. And then we, when we come back, we try to write uh, or uh, to check uh, about the destination of your uh, vac uh, vacation uh, for, the, for who decided to find a, a place, location, uh, to, pro to find it on a, on a website, it's called Geonames, which is a, a MacBook site actually, that also has a, also represented information into our BM. So we find this location, check how it's described in RDF, and try to extract this RDF and use the validator of the W3C to check whether this RDF is valid. Just to have a, a basic, uh, you know, uh, first touch uh, with, uh, with this uh, RDF fragment. Hmm? But first, maybe we can have a 15 minutes break. Okay.